Peace, love, and life family. It's your girl, Morgan Renee Myers, tuning in with another reading of Black Boy by Richard Wright. I'm going to hop right into it tonight. I feel like it'll be a good little bedtime, go to sleep story. We're on chapter 13. In the last chapter, Richard has, in the last few chapters, Richard has moved up to Memphis, Tennessee to get away from Mississippi, the South. Um, my whole back just came off. That's good. I'll type it on later. Um, and he has had a few different job experiences. He didn't got jipped by, um, somebody over some liquor. Um, he's worked a job at an optical, uh, company, an eyeglass company, and there, it was ran by white people, and they got him to fight a black boy that worked at a competing optical company across the street. Um, so they boxed and won money for it, and he lowered his self-esteem about it. So that's pretty much what happened in the last chapter. We'll see what happens now, chapter 13. One morning, I arrived early at work and went into the bank lobby where the Negro porter was mopping. I stood at a counter and picked up the Memphis Commercial Appeal and began my free reading of the press. I came finally to the editorial page and saw an article dealing with one H.L. Minchin or Minkin Minkin M-E-N-C-K-E-N who has a last name like that? Minkin I knew by hearsay that he was the editor of the American Mercury but aside from that I knew nothing about him concluding with one hot short sentence Minkin is a fool I wondered what on earth this Minkin had done to call upon him the scorn of the South. The only people I ever heard denounced in the South were Negroes, and this man was not a Negro. Then, what ideas did Minkin hold that made a newspaper like the Commercial Appeal castigate him publicly? Undoubtedly, he must be advocating ideas that the South did not like. Were there, then, people other than Negroes who criticized the South? I knew that during the Civil War, the South had hated Northern whites, but I had not encountered such hate during my life. Knowing no more of Minkin than I did at the moment, I felt a vague sympathy for him. Had not the South, which had assigned me the role of a non-man, cast at him its hardest words? Now, how could I find out about this Minkin? There was a huge library near the riverfront, but I knew that Negroes were not allowed to patronize its shelves any more than they were the parks and playgrounds of the city. I had gone into the library several times to get books for the white men on the job. Which of them would now help me to get books? That's crazy. You could even go check out a book at the library? Even in Memphis, Tennessee, he wasn't even in the South no more. I could not imagine not going into a library, going to a library and not being able to check out a book. Just because I was black. Lord knew not to have me born in them times. I wouldn't have made it out. I'd have died immediately. For disturbing the peace. For causing a ruckus. Oh my God. So he said, I had gone into the library several times to get books for the white men on the job. Which of them would now help me to get books? And how could I read them without causing concern to the white men with whom I worked? I had so far been successful in hiding my thoughts and feelings from them. But I knew that I would create hostility if it went about this if I went about this business of reading in a clumsy way, okay? You got to read on the, on the sly, on the slow tip. Niggas don't even read no more. Let me not say that. There are a bunch of us that do read and people that like to listen to books being read. So, we're not going to focus on that. Um... I weighed the personalities of the men on the job. There was Don, a Jew, but I distrusted him. His position was not much better than mine, and I knew that he was uneasy and insecure. He had always treated me in an offhand, bantering way that barely concealed his contempt. I was afraid to ask him to help me to get books. His frantic desire to demonstrate a racial solidarity with the whites against Negroes might make him betray me. I would have died immediately too, sis Lynch. Quick. They they lynched me quick, sis, period. Like, pow, pow, something. I'd have been gone. Lineage done with me. Because what you're not going to do. <laughs> then, how about the boss? No, he was a Baptist, and I had the suspicion that he would not be quite able to comprehend why a black boy would want to read Mencken. Then there were other white men on the job whose attitudes showed clearly that they were cluxers or sympathizers and they were out of the question. They remain, there remained only one man whose attitude did not fit into an anti-Negro category, for I had heard the white men refer to him as Pope Lover. His was an 
Irish cat. He was an Irish Catholic and was hated by the white Southerners. I knew that he read books because I had got him volumes from the library several times. Since he too was an object of hatred, I felt that he might refuse me, but would hardly betray me. I hesitated, weighing and balancing the imponderable realities. One morning, I paused before the Catholic fellow's desk. I want to ask you a favor, I whispered to him. What is it? I want to read. I can't get books from the library. I wonder if you let me use your card. He looked at me suspiciously. My card is full most of the time, he said. I see, I said and waited, posing my question silently. You're not trying to get me into trouble, are you, boy? He asked, staring at me. Oh, no, sir. What book do you want? A book by H.L. Mencken. Which one? I don't know. Has he written more than one? He has written several. I didn't know that. What makes you want to meet Mencken? Oh, I just saw his name in the newspaper, I said. It's good of you to want to read, he said. But you ought to read the right things. I said nothing. What do you want to supervise my reading? Let me think, he said. I'll figure something out. I turned from him, and he called me back. He stared at me quizzically. Richard, don't mention this to the other white men, he said. I understand, I said. I won't say a word. A few days later, he called me to him. I've got my cards in my wife. I've got a card in my wife's name. He said, "Here's mine." Thank you, sir. Do you think you can manage it? I'll manage fine. I said, "If they suspect you, you'll get in trouble." He said, "I'll write the same kind of notes to the library that you wrote when you sent books for me." I told him, "I'll sign with your name." He laughed. Go ahead, let me see what you get, he said. That afternoon, I addressed myself to forging a note. Now that the names of the book, now, what were the names of the books written by H.L. Mencken? I did not know any of them. I finally wrote what I thought would be a foolproof, a foolproof note. Dear Madam, will you please let this nigger boy, I use the word nigger to make the librarian feel that I could not possibly be the author of the note, have some books by H.L. Mencken. I forged the white man's name. I entered the library as I'd always done when on errands for whites, but I felt that I would somehow slip up and betray myself. I dove my hat, stood a respectful dif stood a respectful distance from the desk, looked as unbookish as possible, and waited for the white patrons to be taken care of. When the desk was clear of people, I still waited. The white librarian looked at me. What do you want, boy? As though as I did not possess the power of speech, I stepped forward and simply handed her the forged note, not parting my lips. What books by Minkin does he want? she asked. I don't know, ma'am, I said, avoiding her eyes. Who gave you this card? Mr. Falk, I said. Where is he? He's at work at the M dash, I guess he didn't want to name it, optical company. I said, I've been here for him before. I remember, the woman said, but he never wrote notes like this. Oh, God, she's suspicious. Perhaps she would not let me have the books. If she had turned her back at that moment, I would have ducked out the door and never gone back. Then I thought of a bold idea. You can call him up, ma'am, I said, my heart pounding. You're not using these books, are you? She asked pointedly. Oh, no, ma'am, I can't read. I don't know why he wa I don't know what he wants by Minkin, she said under her breath. I knew now that I had won. She was thinking of other things, and the race question had gone out of her mind. She went to the shelves. Once or twice, she looked over her shoulder at me as though she was still doubtful. Finally, she came forward with two books in her hand. I'm sending him two books, she said, but tell Mr. Falk to come in next time or send me the names of the books he wants. I don't know what he wants to read. I said nothing. She stamped the card and handed me the books. Not daring to glance at them, I went out of the library, fearing that the woman would call me back for further questioning. A block away from the library, I opened one of the books and read a title, A Book of Prefaces. prefaces. I was nearing my 19th birthday, and I did not know how to pronounce the word preface. Me either, and I'm 28. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I thumbed the pages and saw strange words and strange names. I shook my head, disappointed. I looked at the other book. It was called Prejudices. I knew what that word meant. I had heard it all my life. And right off, I was on guard against Minkin's books. Why would a man want to call a book Prejudices? The word was so strange with all my memories of racial hate that I could not conceive of any of anybody using it for a title. A man who had prejudices must be wrong. When I showed the books to Mr. Falk, he looked at me and frowned. That librarian might telephone you, I warned him. That's all right, he said, but when you're through reading those books, I want you to tell me what you get out of them. That night in my rented room, while letting the hot water run over my can of pork and beans in the sink, I opened a book of prefaces to be and began to read. I was jarred and shocked by the style, the clean 
the clear, clean, sweeping sentences. Why did he write like that? And how did one write like that? I pictured the man as a raging demon, slashing with his pen, consumed with hate, denouncing everything American, extolling everything European or German, laughing at the weaknesses of people, mocking God, authority. What was this? I stood up, trying to realize what reality lay behind the meaning of the words. Yes, this man was fighting fighting with words he was using words as a weapon using them as one would use a club could words be weapons well yes for here they were then maybe perhaps i could use them as a weapon no it frightened me i read on and what amazed me was not what he said but how on earth anybody had the courage to say it i feel like that sometimes Let me pause for a second. Let me go back. And this is what I like about reading. Sometimes something to strike me and it hit me and I had to go back and read it a few times. But I think I feel that way with some of my thoughts. Um, because I'm a poet and I'm a writer, how you word things is so important. And I've learned by the questions that I ask my audience and how I word it that sometimes something can come off offensively or um, it could trigger somebody. And as the writer or the author, you're not thinking of saying, oh, trigger warning or, um, you know, people just taking things personally. But how you word things matter and what you say and just the power that it holds. So let me reread that part. So what was this? <coughs> I stood up trying to realize what reality lay behind the meaning of the words. Yes, this man was fighting, fighting with words. That's why I think people appreciate poetry and poems and artists and TV shows. The writing, it's the writing. You can fight with words. That's why activists and the Black Panthers in the 60s were so important for us because we could use our, our word and our impact. And some people feel like... For those that are, I guess, famous or have a platform for multiple people to hear them and all you want to do is shake your ass or just talk about your beauty or rap about being the best, the baddest, the wettest, the this, the daddest, like it kind of takes away from the power of how you could be utilizing your words. Just my little two cents. So, yes, this man was fighting, fighting with words. He was using words as a weapon, using them as one would use a club. Could words be weapons? Well, yes, for here they were. Then maybe perhaps I could use them as a weapon. Then maybe perhaps I could use them as a weapon. No. It frightened me. I read on, and what amazed me was not what he said, but how on earth anybody had the courage to say it. Occasionally, I glanced up to reassure myself that I was alone in the room. Who were these men about whom Minkin were talking so passionately? Who was... Okay, so it's parts like this. I didn't know none of these people. I take a picture or I highlight or I stop and go research. And that's why I be getting stuck in books taking forever. Because I be stopping and looking up people or trying to write down stuff. So I'm about to say a whole bunch of names, authors, I don't know. But that Minkin was talking about in his book and that obviously Richard Wright remembered. Uh, so who were these men about whom Mickin was so talking so passionately? Who was Anatole France, Joseph Conrad, Sinclair Lewis, Sherwood Anderson, Dust, Dustoveski, George Moore, Gustave Flaubert, Maupassant, Toy Story, Frank Harris, Mark Twain, Thomas Hardy, Errol Bennett, Stephen Crane, Zola, Norris, Gorky, Bergson, Ibsen, Balzac, Bernard Shaw, Dumas, Poe, Thomas Mann, O. Henry, Dreiser, H.G. Wells, Gogol, T.S. Eliot, Guide or Gide, Baudelaire, Edgar Lee Masters, Stenhal, Turgenev, Hunnaker, Nietzsche, and I don't know how to pronounce that, and a score of others. Were these men real? Did they exist or have they existed? And how did one pronounce their names? <laughs> yes, Richard. How the hell you pronounce these names? I ran across many words whose meanings I did not know. And I either looked them up in the dictionary. Oh, like I be doing. Okay. Well, before I had a chance to do that, encountered the word in a context that made its meaning clear. Context clues. I can keep reading the sentence and figure out what the word means. So when I look it up in the dictionary, I'm on cue. Or I'm totally wrong and I learn. That's why you can't just be reading and read. You got to read, research, understand. Read, research, regurgitate what you learned, what you read. 
So, um, in Canada, but what strange world was this? I concluded the book with the conviction that I had somehow overlooked something terribly important in life. I had once tried to write, had once reveled in feeling, had let my crude imagination roam, but the impulse to dream had been slowly beaten out of me by experience. Now it surged up again, and I hungered for books, new ways of looking and seeing. It was not a matter of believing or disbelieving what I read, but of feeling something new, of being affected by something that made the look of the world different as dawn broke i ate my pork and beans feeling dopey sleepy i went to work but the mood of the book would not die it lingered coloring everything i saw heard did i now felt that i knew what the white men were feeling merely because i had read a book that had spoken of how they lived and thought i identified myself with that book i felt vaguely guilty would I, filled with bookish notions, act in a manner that would make the whites dislike me? I forged more notes, and my trips to the library became frequent. Reading grew into a passion. My first serious novel was Sinclair Lewis's Main Street. It made you see my boss. It made me see my boss, Mr. Gerald, and identify him as an American type. I want to look up that book. Let me highlight that. Who was this? Sinclair Lewis Main Street. So he died my. Um, I was smile when I saw him lugging his golf bags into the office. I had always felt a vast distance separating me from the boss, and now I felt closer to him, though still distant. I felt now that I knew him, that I could feel the very limits of his narrow life, and this happened because I had read a novel about a mythical man called George F. Babbitt. The plots and stories in the novels did not interest me so much as the point of view revealed. I gave myself over to each novel without reserve, without trying to criticize it. It was enough for me to see and feel something different. And for me, it was enough for me to see and feel something different. And for me, everything was something different. Reading was like a drug, a dope. The novels created moods in which I lived for days, but I could not conquer my sense of guilt, my feeling that the white men around me knew that I was changing and that I began to regard them differently. Whenever I brought a book on the job, I wrapped it in newspaper, a habit that was to persist for years in other cities and under other circumstances. But some of the white men pried into my packages when I was absent and they questioned me. Boy, what are you reading those books for? Oh, I don't know, sir. That's deep stuff you're reading, boy. It's just killing time, sir. You out of your brains if you don't watch out. I read Dreiser's Jeannie, Garrett Hart, and Sister Carrie, and they revived me in a vivid sense of my mother's suffering. I was overwhelmed. Highlight that. I grew silent, wondering about the life around me. It would have been impossible for me to have told anyone that I derived from these novels, for it was nothing less than a sense of life itself. All my life has shaped me for the realism, the naturalism of the modern novel, and I cannot read enough of them. Steeped in new books and ideas, I bought a ream of paper and tried to write, but nothing would come, and what did come was flat beyond telling. I discovered that more than desire and feeling were necessary to write, and I dropped the idea. Yet I still wondered how I was possible to know people sufficiently to write about them could i ever learn about life and people to me with my vast ignorance my jim crow station in life it seemed a task impossible of achievement i now knew that being what what being a negro meant i could endure the hunger i had learned to live and hate i had learned to live with hate but the urge that there were feelings denied me that the very breath of life itself was beyond my reach that more than anything else hurt wounded me i had a new hunger emboying 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 emboyo b u o y i n g boyoing me up emboying me up reading was also Reading also cast me down, made me see what was possible, what I had missed. My tension returned, new, terrible, bitter, surging, all most too great to be contained. I no longer felt that the world about me was hostile, killing. I knew it. A million times I asked myself what I could do to save myself, and there were no answers. I seemed forever condemned, ringed by walls. I did not discuss my reading with Mr. Falk, who had lent me his library card. It would have meant talking about myself, and that would have been too painful. I smiled each day, fighting desperately to maintain my old behavior to keep my disposition seemingly sunny. But some of the white men discerned that I had begun to brood. 
Wake up there, boy, Mr. Olin said one day. Sir, I answered for the lack of a better word. You act like you've stolen something, he said. I laughed in a way that I knew he expected me to laugh, but I resolved to be more conscious of myself, to watch my every act, to guard and hide the new knowledge that was dawning within me. If I went north, would it be possible for me to build a new life then? How could a man build a life upon vague, uninformed yearnings? I wanted to write, and I did not even know the English language. I bought English grammars and found them dull. I felt that I was getting a better sense of the language from novels than from the grammars. I read hard, discarding a writer as soon as I felt that I had grasped this point of view. At night, the printed page stood before my eyes in sleep. Mrs. Moss, my landlady, asked me one Sunday morning, Son, what is it that you keep on reading? Oh, nothing, just novels. What you get out of them? I'm just killing time, I said. I hope you know your own mind, she said in a tone which implied that she doubted if I had a mind. I knew of no Negroes who read the books I liked, and I wonder if any Negroes ever thought of them. I knew that there were Negro doctors, lawyers, newspaper men, but I never saw any of them. When I read a Negro, pa Negro paper, I never caught the faintest echo of my preoccupation in its pages. I felt trapped, and occasionally, for a few days, I would stop reading. But a vague hunger would come over me for books, books that opened up new avenues of feeling and seeing. And again, I would forge another note to the white librarian. Again, I would read and wonder, as only the naive and unlettered can read and wonder, feeling that I carried a secret criminal burden about with me each day. Just don't want to read. Mm. That winter, my mother and brother came, and we set up housekeeping, buying furniture on the installment plan, being cheated, and yet knowing no way to avoid it. I began to eat warm food, and to my surprise, found that regular meals enabled me to read faster. I may have lived through many illnesses and survived them, never suspecting that I was ill. My brother obtained a job, and we began to save toward the trip north, plotting our time, setting tentative dates for departure. I told none of the white men on the job that I was planning to go north. I knew that the moment they felt I was thinking of north, they would change toward me. It would have made them feel that I did not like the life I was living, and because my life was completely conditioned by what they said or did, it would have been tantamount to challenging them. I could calculate my chances for life in the South as a Negro fairly clearly now. I could fight the Southern whites by organizing with other Negroes as my grandfather had done, but I knew that I could never win that way. There were many whites and there were but few blacks. They were strong and we were weak. Outright black rebellion could never win. If I fought openly, I would die, and I did not want to die. News of lynchings were frequent. I could submit and live the life of a genial slave, but that was impossible. All of my life had shaped me to live by my own feelings and thoughts. I could make up to Bess and marry her and inherit the house, but that, too, would be the life of a slave. If I did that, I would crush the death I would crush to death something within me, and I would hate myself as much as I knew the whites already hated those who had submitted neither could had done neither could i ever willingly present myself to be kicked as shorty has done i would rather have died than do that i could drain off my restlessness by fighting with shorty and harrison i had seen many negroes solve the problem of being black by transferring their hatred of themselves to others with a black skin and fighting them um this is black boy by richard wright i'm on chapter 13 i've been reading it, honey you gotta catch up on youtube uh, I could not, of course, forget what I had read. Okay, my pages is thinning out. I had read... I can't see that word. I had read something, the whites out of my mind forget them and find release from anxiety and longing and sex and alcohol but the memory of how my father had conducted himself made that course repugnant if i did not want others to violate my life how could i voluntarily laid it myself violate it myself I had no hope whatever of being a professional man. Not only had I been so conditioned that I did not desire it, but the fulfillment of such an ambition was beyond my capabilities. Well-to-do Negroes lived in a world that was almost as alien to me as the world inhabited by whites. What then was there? I held my life in my mind and my consciousness each day, feeling at times that I would stumble and drop it, spill it forever. My reading had created a vast sense of distance between me and the world in which I lived and tried to make a living and that sense of distance was increasing each day my days and nights were one long quiet continuously contained dream of terror tension and anxiety i wonder how long i could bear it 
that's the end of chapter 13. I believe we only have one chapter left, chapter 14. Yep. And afterwards. So I'll check in with you all soon. Thank you for tuning in. Peace, love, and light.